Ladies and gentlemen, it's all about the image. And it's all about the image and you. This little painting that you see here in front of me is actually painted in 1632 by Rembrandt. It's the anatomical lesson of Dr. Nicholas Tulp, the head of the Amsterdam Surgeon Guild, testing out new technologies on a corpse, teaching his students how the body works, and effectively, that is still something what we're trying to do today. And today I'm going to share with you our vision of how molecular images can actually make this procedure even much more precise, and how it can affect your lives in general, and how we are now, in my opinion, in the dawn of can new cancer surgery. So, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to have a look first in the operating room, the operating room of today. Today's operating room is actually fairly crowded, small, a lot of people, lots of technology around the patient. So we need to invest in new operating rooms. And these new operating rooms need to meet new standards. The new standards of our insights that is ever increasing. So the new operating rooms look a little bit like this. Bigger, but there's one essential element missing here. There are no people here, right? But there's also space for new technologies. And these new technologies are technologies that will allow us to diagnose diseases more precise, more rapidly, and while the surgeon is operating. So what do we need to do to actually establish this? Well, first of all, we need to fill the operating room with people. So and this is how we do science nowadays. Together with our surgeons, fundamental scientists, mass spectrometrists, fusion scientists like myself, a little bit weird background, we gather on top of a Swiss mountain, and we ski, and we drink, and we eat, and we talk. And we talk to each other, trying to learn from each other what the different problems are that the medical people, the surgeons, are facing. We tell them about our new technologies, and we realize more and more that in order to tackle the challenges they face every day in their ORs, we need to work together. We need to cross the boundaries of our disciplines. We need to feed on each other's knowledge, spread the word, and actually listen. Listen to each other's needs. So I come from a very technological background, and for years I've been developing new instruments that in my mind could really you know, benefit humanity and the world. I never went into a hospital until I moved to this new laboratory where we now actually engage with these clinicians together. And we do that for a very specific reason, and it was already mentioned, personalized medicine. That is what we try to do. And why do we do that? Well, if I look at all of you here, you're all very different. Yeah, you're different genetically on the genome level. But yet, if you come into the hospital treated, are going to be treated or diagnosed with a specific cancer, your treatment is very similar based on your body weight. Yeah, and based on your body weight, you get a certain type of medication in a certain dose. But you're all different. You all metabolize these drugs differently. So why not make it more personal or precise? We also think that with all these new diagnostic tools, we might learn better how to prevent diseases. On top of that, if we have all this information, we might predict how you would respond to therapy. And in the end, we want all of that technology in this iPhone, yeah, so that you can take a snapshot of your own body and actually participate in doing your diagnosis. So how do we do that? Well, we use new technologies. We use new technologies to examine the body, tissues, from pathology biopsies that have been taken in the hospital, uh, and we want to look at them on the molecular level. The molecular level tells us what all the molecules are, and I'll tell you in a minute how we do that. We want to look at these molecules in the context of a cell, the cell in the context of a tissue, the tissue in the context of the patient. Crucially to that is that we can do this directly on biopsies that are taken from a patient. Right now, a pathologist does exactly this in the hospital. His only tool is his mind. Because based on what he knows and what he's learned in the past, he looks at the shape of these cells, the nuclei of the cells, and he looks at it and says, hmm, based on this type of experience that I've seen these images, this is good or this is bad. He does this by using two colors, red and blue. Red and blue and only morphology. No molecular information if he needs to do this while the patient is still on the table of the surgeon. So how do we improve that? 
Well, one way we improve that is actually using a technology that's called mass spectrometry. I'm going to explain to you a little bit how that works. And mass spectrometry uses something that some of you might have been familiar with in high school, the periodic table of the elements. Methane, natural gas, carbon, four hydrogens, carbon weighs 12 atomic mass units, hydrogen one, so combined it's 16. Now, each molecule in your body has a different weight. So, if we can determine the weight, conversely, we can tell you what molecule it is. Now, how do we do that? We use a scale, yeah, and not one like this, a little bit more advanced. But um, the scale, nevertheless, and we determine the molecular weight of these molecules. Now, one way of doing it is by sending these molecules out on a race. E is a half mv squared kinetic energy. If all molecules have the same kinetic energy, so they get the same push in the mass spectrometer, the light ones will fly very fast. The heavy ones will go very slow. Yeah. So by measuring their arrival time, we can very accurately determine their molecular weight. Now, and it's a little bit similar like the scale. If a molecule flies by on the detector, if the scale tilts, and we know that there's an ion there. So we use these scales for molecules. Now, the question is, how do we generate these molecules from these biopsies? Well, we do that in a very simple experiment. I can illustrate that. We take a particle. Yeah, it can be a photon, it can be a particle, or it can be your sun. It's accelerated to the surface, creates a splash, a molecular splash. Scale now, we're talking about 50 nanometers, not here the scale of the Adriatic Sea. And the splashes, the droplets of water, are actually sucked up by the mass spectrometer and they're analyzed. And we determine the composition of all of the molecules in these droplets. And there's not one molecule, there are literally thousands and thousands of molecules in the droplets. Now, we do this point by point. We have the biopsy in front of us, and every point we measure a spectrum and the composition. We go to the next point, measure it again, and we create a molecular image that looks a little bit like this. Now, uh, you can see the university that I teach. Um, the logo is printed, and on top of that, we painted some felt-tip pens. And all of these colors are different chemicals. And they're produced by the chemical industry. And by doing this imaging experiment, this molecular imaging experiment, we can now unravel the complexity of the chemistry at the surface. Now, what would happen if we would do this on tissue? Well, one experiment we did in the past was started by uh, two young high school students who came to me and said, Professor Heeren, we have a question. We need to do our high school uh, thesis work, and we want to examine the hairs of our fellow students, and we want to figure out if we can determine what drugs they have been using. <laughs> OK? It went a little bit different. It was a dad, can I ask you a question? Um, so they did. They collected the hairs from the students. They came to our labs, sliced the hairs in the middle, we fired our laser beams on top of it, generated the molecules, and then we collected the composition of the different drugs they'd used, these kids had used. The nice thing about hair is, it's a chemical timeline. Yeah, it shows you chemical changes, it incorporates what's happening in your body, and hour by hour, week by week, month by month, we can tell what's actually going on in these hairs. Now, in this case, they found that one of the students had used 22 different drugs, and on the timeline, we could see party weekend, party weekend, party weekend. <laughs> this was a high school close to Amsterdam, so who knows? Yeah. <laughs> However, timelines and progression in diseases is exactly what we can evaluate. So the way we exp uh, expanded on from that is that we now took a piece of intestines of a mouse that had a colorectal cancer in it, we rolled it out, rolled it up again, sliced it, so that we could see the timeline of progression of diseases. And right here behind me, you actually see in the middle picture, you see three different tumors, where we can now determine the exact molecular composition. Knowing what tumor is there, how food has been processed throughout the intestines, and how this tumor evolved. So we're really getting molecular information. All right, back to the Swiss mountain. Up on top of the Swiss mountain, we were approached by a transplant surgeon who asked us, Ron, we have a problem. In the Netherlands, we have way too few donors. And one of the problems that we have is that sometimes we do not know what the quality of the organs that we want to transplant is. 
Can you help us? Can you come up with a new way using your molecular imaging techniques to tell us the quality of these organs? So we said, okay, well, let's do an experiment and see if we can. So what we did, we went to the slaughterhouse, took two kidneys, two pig kidneys. One of them was perfused, so they, they, they let blood go through it under normal temperatures. That is a lot of damage. These organs die very quickly. The other organ, the other kidney, was perfused under cold temperatures, the way you would store something like in the fridge. We took biopsies from these kidneys after a certain amount of, uh, let's say, being out of the body. And we asked the pathologist, well, based on your experience, based on your knowledge about these kidney tissues, tell us if it's good or bad. Tell us if it's damaged or not. And they did. They didn't know what was what, uh, so it was a blinded experiment. And they got it right in 38% of the times. 38%. That's worse than flipping a coin. So, then we said, okay, we'll take exactly these same tissue sections that you've looked at, and we'll now fire our lasers on it, and we'll examine what we see as imaging mass spectrometrists. We generate our molecular images, and lo and behold, when we did it, we got it right 100% of the time. I mean, we're very proud of ourselves, you know. Yes, we saved the world! Yet, this was on a kidney, uh, this is not a patient, but it does show you the impact of this molecular diagnosis and how we can assist the pathologist in making their diagnosis more precise. So, and that is actually one of the major problems that pathologists, specifically in cancer surgery, face. They actually face tissue that is continuously changing because of the disease. Right here behind me, you'll see some images, some of you might have seen this on Facebook, um, that is continuously changing. I'm challenging you to figure out, as this movie plays, how many changes there are in this particular image. And I want to remind you that these changes that you see here behind me are also going on in your body. You might not be aware of it. Your surgeon or your medic, your uh, GP might not be aware of it. But it is happening. So the question is, can we visualize these a little bit better? One of my heroes is Richard Feynman. He's a physicist, Nobel Prize winning physicist. He once said, you've got to stop and think about the inconceivable nature of nature. And that's exactly what we're trying to unravel. Looking at the chemistry of the surfaces, we can actually do exactly that. Now, you've seen there are about 30 changes in this, uh, this particular movie. I don't know if you caught them all. We try to do exactly that. If you think about a tumor, it's not a tumor. It's not one cell type. It's thousands of different cells, differently color-coded. And if you get a treatment, some of the cells might respond very well. Some of the cells, like the red and the blue one, are not responding at all. And they might grow out into a new tumor that cannot be treated. So, what we do is we use our imaging technologies to figure out the exact composition, the different cell types in the tumor, and tweak the treatment accordingly. Now, that we can do that shows the next image. This is a number of different tumors, and all the different colors are different cell types in these tumors. And based on this composition, a surgeon can determine, well, is this good? Is this bad? What's the composition? How should I treat this patient? What drugs should I use? But we, what we are doing now is we're generating all this molecular data. And, and we're generating literally tons of molecular data. So, more than we can even handle. So, we need informaticians, people who can come up with smart tools that interpret all these spectra and tell us what's red, what's green, what's blue. But what we really want to do is actually put this into the hands of the people who really need this information. And those are the surgeons. So what we want to do, we want to take this very complex instrument, this data, and put it in the hands of guys like this. Steven Alderdaming, he's a liver surgeon, he was with us on top of the mountain, and he came to us and said, Ron, I have a problem too. I operate on a lot of patients that suffer from cholangiocarcinoma. It's a cancer of the bile duct, very nasty, aggressive surgery is needed. They remove half of the liver with the tumor in there. And then, because all the bile ducts are open in the abdomen, they reattach the intestines to the bile duct so that the patients, after the surgery, can digest this food. There's, however, one problem. They can only do that once. They cannot go back in and take the intestines off and put it back on. No, they can't do that. 
So they have to make absolutely sure that the margin of the material that Stephen has resected is actually clean of tumor cells. So he asked us, can, you, can your technologies, while my patient is on the table, and I've taken out this tumor, can your technologies look at these slices that now go to the pathologist, and the pathologist says, well, with 75, 80% certainty, it's clean. Can you be more precise? Can you make it more accurate? So we did that experiment. We took some of the cholangiocarcinomas that Stephen has resected. We subjected them to our imaging technologies. And we get all of this molecular information on different proteins that are there in that piece of tissue. And by doing the classification of the different cell types, we find out that the blue cells is the margin, it's normal tissue. The red cells are tumor cells that are already changing, but the morphology is not changing. So the pathologist cannot see that something's going on. And the green cells are actually the tumor cells. So in that light, we actually have now come up with a perfect diagnosis of tumor margin. But how do we now put this into the hands of Stephen? Well, if you think about it, in every oncological procedure, whether it's lung, colorectal, ovary tumors, 20% of the patients have to be re-operated on. And that 20% is a huge number. So we want to reduce that to 5%, and we're going to do this by barbecuing. Yeah, so maybe a little strange, but I'm going to walk over here to demonstrate a little barbecue experiment. Um, and we call this the eye knife. Now, a surgeon uses this as an electrical surgical tool. It's a cauterizing knife. He burns material, and I will demonstrate this on my favorite patient, a piece of chicken wing. Um, and what it does, as you will see, it, will, it actually generates smoke. And the people in the front row, might actually uh, start to smell something in a little bit. Um, or maybe the whole audience will smell something. This smoke, if you smell this, it smells pretty bad, actually. Uh, that's how it smells in the theater. But if we do this on a barbecue and we put a piece of salmon on the barbecue, it would be very, very different. The smell would be very, very different. So that means there's information in this smoke that the surgeon is already producing. So. We have in the lab this eye knife hooked up to our mass spectrometers. And we remember we have the imaging data, which has all these molecular profiles of good and bad cells. So now PMAX here, Pierre, uh, one of the PhD students at the university, is actually doing an experiment where he's doing the measurement on chicken and measurement on beef liver. And directly from the analysis of this smoke, he can actually tell what type of food it is. Great for testing hamburgers, whether there's horse meat in there or not. But even better, <laughs> to test patients. When the surgeon is operating, he can immediately diagnose, is this good or bad? If a woman comes in for breast cancer surgery and a lump is removed, now she has to wait two weeks until she gets her diagnosis, because the pathologist takes so much time to accurately determine it. With a technology like this, when she wakes up, she will actually know what is going on, whether it's good or bad. So that is what we are trying to do in the molecular OR, combining these molecular imaging tools with the eye knife to move away from procedures like that to very accurate, precise, personalized, preventive medicine in the clinic. And the people who are actually doing that are right here behind me. And they are the ones who are really changing the dawn of cancer surgery, working on technology, working on the molecules, working with the surgeons to implement this in the hospital. So to them in particular, I'm incredibly indebted and grat gratified that they are actually doing this together with me. And with that, I'm going to stop and thank you for your attention.